Welcome to the Monday, October 6, 2014 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. May we please have the roll call. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McCausland? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Wagner? Present. And Councilor Walsh? Here. May we pl pledge allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any town council reports and correspondence? Councilor Jordan? Um, I have two things. One is from the recycling committee. Their composting survey just went live and it will be up on the town website soon. So please take a moment and check out that and complete it so we can get as much input as we can. Also, uh, the town council will be working on goal setting in a couple of months. So per request from a citizen, I'm requesting some input from the public at large to email us any ideas that you think we should be working on for goals in the coming year of 2015. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Walsh? Uh, the Senior Citizen Advisory Commission um, is uh, hot at work. Um, since they were officially put in place, they've met every two weeks. It's hard to believe the amount of time that this group has spent. Under the uh, chairmanship of Brett Seekins, they will be coming to the council next month in hopes of being able to get us up to speed in terms of the good work that they've been involved with. And in the next several weeks, they have um, some public input sessions scheduled uh, to gain some, a better understanding of the, the issues that are confronting our seniors and our community. And um, you know, I applaud that effort. And um, I wanted to just bring that to the attention of the uh, town council. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I had a couple Jessica, things. Did, I'm sorry. One other thing. We had oh. the uh, good fortune of attending a dinner, appreciation dinner, for the um, Portland Museum um, store uh, volunteers the other night at Higgins, uh, at the Higgins uh, <laughs> Beach. Uh, and I will tell you, it was um, a full house, and there were actually four of the councilors present. So it was a pretty um, great showing of appreciation and thanks to a group of volunteers who make everything happen out there at Fort Williams. So a lot of great feedback, a lot of great conversation, and, uh, and, and a wonderful group of volunteers who come from all over, not just in Cape Elizabeth, to, to work at the, uh, for, you know, at the fort. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Councilor McCausland. <clears throat> Um, yes, just wanted to remind people that next month the citizens of Cape Elizabeth will be voting on the uh, renovation reconstruction project for the Thomas Memorial Library. Information is available for anyone who needs it. It's on the town website. It's on the library website. There's information in the library itself. I think we still have information available over at Community Services as well, and you can certainly um, email any one of us on the council and we can get back to you with more information if you need it. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> I have a couple items. Um, I was, thank you, Council Walsh. I was going to mention the volunteer appreciation dinner and <clears throat> it was, it's a great time to um, thank all the volunteers that work at the Portland Headlight Museum shop. Um, this Saturday, another recycling committee um, event for paper shredding. This is extremely popular. And I think probably a lot of people have it on their calendar. <laughs> You're allowed four boxes per vehicle, so don't miss it. Um, I'd also like to mention that this, uh, a week from this Wednesday, on October 15th, is the first of two candidates' nights uh, held by the Cape Elizabeth High School government class under the uh, guidance of their teacher, Ted Jordan. On the 15th, it will be here from 7 to 9 p.m., and the, that night we'll have the <coughs> legislative candidates. The following Wednesday, October 22nd, um, the government class will hold candidates' night for the local municipal candidates. So that's, that's always a well-attended event and um, a wonderful evening that the, the government class puts on. Um, so moving right along. 
Could we please have the Finance Committee report? Thank you, uh, Jessica. Um, I thank you to the Town Council for attending the uh, meeting with our auditors <coughs> last week. We had uh, five members of the school board join us as well, which was a good showing. I really appreciate their uh, involvement as well. And uh, you have 28 pages of the financial report um, in your packet. I'm sure all of you have uh, spent uh, time reading it. But the highlights are that uh, our house is in order and uh, our excise tax revenues are up. Uh, the revenue at the uh, museum at, at the Portland Head Light is down slightly by 5000 And um, I think revenue sharing is really just a direct result of some timing issues more than anything else. But uh, you have 28 pages for your, uh, your reading pleasure. Um, and um, again, uh, in talking to the town manager, we, our house is in order. Things are on track. You know, Council Welch, I, if I'm correct in my memory, they, our building permits are up 87 percent. I think that's on that initial page. That's a pretty, uh, pretty impressive number, I think. Yeah, that's the breakout. Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Budget. Building permit fees. Yeah, building permit fees. Yeah, um, 120,000 uh, basically up 87.8 percent. It's pretty impressive. So. It's pretty amazing. Year, uh, last year was $90,000 for the same period. So some pent up demand that is coming forward, I think. Um, all good investments in our community and people's homes and thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, Councilor Jordan, did I miss? Oh, I just had one more uh, reminder that the fall cleanup at the transfer, cent cent transfer station starts this weekend from October 11th to October 27th. You can bring disposal items and the fee is waived for citizens. So thank you. It. Okay. And the town, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> we have an opportunity right now for citizens to uh, address the council on items that are not on this evening's agenda. Is there anyone wishing to do so? Okay, that, thank you. There's no one that has come forward. And now could we have the town manager's report? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. First, the council had authorized in the budget for us to, to uh, upgrade some of what we're doing in the human resource area. And I just wanted to report that this morning was the first meeting uh, that the department heads had with an HR consultant that we're working with, a, a gentleman by the name of Rick Dacry. And um, amongst other things that uh, he will be doing working with them is reviewing all of our human resource systems and practices. Uh, he's going to be having individual meetings with every department heads to go over all of our record keeping policies, practices, systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera, training and development, uh, job descriptions performance appraisal forms, uh, leave procedures, recruitment and hiring procedures, uh, career uh, development issues, uh, and on. Uh, as part of our agreement with him, uh, he also has an HR helpline uh, that any department head can give him a call and get practical advice and counsel on any employee issues, uh, long-term strategies for management, and just, just generally advice. He's also going to be working with us on developing new job descriptions for the Thomas More Library, uh, assuming uh, the positions are evolving there. And uh, we'll then be also doing a, a pay study uh, for the library positions uh, once that those job descriptions are completed. So anyway, that's underway. And uh, he's going to be meeting individually with each department head in, in, uh, between now and the end of the month. Uh, I did also want to mention we, we've had a number of citizens who have passed away this past month since the last council meeting. Uh, Bob Hannigan was uh, he actually a member of the planning board back in the 1960s uh, during a time when it was, it was extremely busy. And uh, well, Some of you may know Janet Hannigan, Bob's wife. Janet uh, works for us as the Spurling Church greeter. Uh, Tom Summers, uh, I, I don't think it's been in the newspaper yet, but also passed away. Uh, he was our planning board chairman. Uh, back in the 1980s for, for a number of years, uh, was very involved in reviewing a lot of subdivisions that probably people in the audience uh, watching and otherwise now live in. Uh, but uh, just a, a fine person. His, his wife, Lydia, was also very active on our board of historic preservation advisors. So just a, you know, a really a, a nice couple and uh, 
Tom and Bob will be missed. And finally, John Swinehart was one of our dispatchers uh, for, uh, for, I don't know the exact number of years, uh, 20 or so, uh, but he was, he was one of the dispatchers when we closed dispatching, and one of the ones that it was tough to, in, in essence, lay him off. Uh, but anyway, he, he remained friendly throughout, even, even after we, we did that. And uh, he was 58 years old, uh, same age as me. So, uh, you know, one of those things that, you know, it really, uh, you know, you think about. So, but just, uh, you know, a, a good worker. He was an excellent dispatcher. And uh, yeah, he'll be missed by his family and a lot of friends. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next item is review of the draft minutes of the September 8, 2014 Town Council meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of September 8, 2014? Councilor Sherman? I move to approve. Is there a second? Councilor Ray? Is there any discussion? Are there any corrections? All those in favor? They are approved unanimously. Okay. The next item is public hearing on the drafts town center plan. So those wishing to come forward to, to express their views, we have a 15-minute max. Each individual has three minutes <coughs> to speak. So we will now open the public hearing on the proposed draft town center plan. Hi, my name is Paul Seidman. I live at 21 Oakview Drive here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I just had a question ab about the draft. Given that it is clear at this point that our village green would be more reasonably and safely located at the new library site, why does there need to be wording in the TCPC report that calls for openness to modifying ordinances in case it ends up by 77? Thank you. Before the next person, I misspoke. There is no time limit on a public hearing. <laughs> Anyone else? Hmm? Overall time limit. Oh, time limit. <coughs> uh, good evening. My name is Jerry Milroy, and I live at Five Spoon Drift Lane here in Cape. Uh, members of the council, uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of the proposed draft plan, support that and also, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but support the Tax Increment Financing District to finance the proposals. As I understand the plan, it focuses on Route 77 as a main street with uh, sidewalks and a developer possibly creating a, a, a small park area. Uh, my question is, is this really to be considered the town center? Uh, I wonder if in the preparation of the draft has it really been considered to extend the sidewalks across the street from the town hall to link the critical town facilities that we have, the pool, the community center, libraries and the stores all together. This would create a pedestrian ways so that children, seniors and others can move in a pedestrian safe free area or environment amongst these facilities in that area. And in creating these linkages between these existing facilities and businesses, it has the opportunity to create a campus-like environment and a campus-like quad, a quad that could take the form of a traditional rural New England village uh, green. And that's a, uh, a question, I guess, before the, the house, if that was being considered as a part of that planning effort. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Never go first. I've learned. Um, Scott Clark, 6 Brentwood Road here in Cape Elizabeth. Last time I was here, I had a little uh, e-cigarette as part of a demonstration. I don't have that this time. <laughs> Um, and I got to start with a joke or I can't speak in public, so. Um, <clears throat> I've read thoroughly everything that the Town Center uh, Committee worked very hard to put together. Um, I really have. I've sort of obsessed over it. When I read something, I, I tend to do that. There are people on the, on the council who know that on the smoking issue, I was quite adamant in that one. So that's the way I am. 
The one question I have for the town council <clears throat> is, do you really think you've got enough public input to this plan, given the magnitude of the plan? If we were talking about something that is an upgrade to the, um, uh, the rules around how a facade of a building is planned, that's one thing. But when you're talking about up to $2.7 million for just sidewalks within the town center, you're talking big bucks here. Compared to the $4 million library you've got coming up, that's over half the cost of that library. So I think it's important that if the town council chooses to move forward with this plan, you've got good public input. I read everything in that plan, or everything in the minutes from the meeting from that, and the one thing that stands out from their, or their uh, October 2013 meeting was there were only 82 respondents that represent the entirety of the input to that committee. Now, there could have been emails, et cetera, et cetera, that, that aren't public. And so there could be more public input. But 82 percent, or 82 respondents out of uh, the 3,900 residences, roughly, that are on Cape Elizabeth, is 2 percent. And I don't think that's enough myself. No matter how well stated the respondents were, <coughs> no matter whether they uh, really took seriously the, the ideas and concepts that were presented to them, you don't have enough people, in my opinion. And the thing that, well, that bothers me more than anything is, if the town agrees that we want a town center and we want to invest millions of bucks in that, that's great. I don't have a problem with that, but I do have a problem with the town spending money in anticipation of a bond being approved when they only to find out, like we did two years ago with the original library plan, that the town wasn't behind the plan. Wouldn't you spend half a million bucks to get to the point of even putting that on the ballot? With the new library, I hear it's up to 300,000 that we've put into that before it's been approved by the town. And to me, that's a waste. We don't have that kind of money to throw around. And so what that says to me is, you gotta have good public input. And in my opinion right now, you don't have it. The other thing is demographics. If you could finish up, your time is up, Mr. Scott, or Mr. Clark, I'm sorry. The, okay, one last thing. Uh, the last point is that uh, in that survey that was taken by the town uh, committee, town center committee, was a question, do you want the town to look into its, its uh, zoning rules and regulations to make building a business in the town center easier for, for businesses to do. 60% of the people said no. What that says is something we all know. Nobody wants businesses in the town center. And that's been documented over and over and over again. Thank so. you very much, Mr. Clark. Okay. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Mary Townsend. I live at 5 Pearl Street. Um, and I just wanted to, as a former member of the committee, um, reiterate a little of what I said uh, a few months ago. Um, Caitlin, I was excited to hear that goal setting is becoming a priority in terms of getting some public input. And I would like to suggest that what you do is you look at um, doing a um, an open forum such as the library forum where you have the public come in and and you talk about what the public sees as the goals so we don't wind up with um, a goal that maybe um, as this gentleman suggests isn't reflective of public priorities um, so I'd like to make that suggestion I think another thing um, that you can look at is appointing balanced committees really look at your appointments committee look at making sure you have all viewpoints um, represented a as much as you can. Um, I would also say, um, and I brought this up last time, and I would really like to see a change in reporting of meetings because you can't tell what happens at meetings if committee members are um, responsible for taking minutes. Um, I'm not sure why we don't record meetings so we can see on online 
how these um, committees come up with the recommendations that they come up with, what the process is. It might be helpful for the public. Um, so um, I would suggest that um, those three things and, um, you know, it's, you know, we live in a very small town. It's very easy to pick up the phone and figure out what people's responses are. Um, so I would suggest, um, you know, sort of, uh, I guess what I'm talking about now is your code of ethics, and I was glad to see that you were looking at, at some of that. Um, and I'd like to see you expand that to some guidelines that, and recommendations around how you handle emails in particular. I think that was a problem with this committee, was that emails were handled in a way that some people um, considered uh, getting information, you know, that responding to group emails um, using a person's private email was used um, as a forum where, uh, you know, I think we need to have some guidelines around that just so people understand what they're dealing with when they email the council um, and, and what happens. So I'd like to see what your response is to that. And thank you for your service and thank you for the opportunity to um, talk with you. Good evening. I'm Sarah Lennon. I live at 54 Cranbrook Drive. Um, I want to thank all of you for your service to our community and town. Uh, it seems like there's a theme developing, and that is this craving for people have for more citizen input or maybe more work that's reflected of what the majority of people in Cape desire. And I'm just going to pick up on that. I agree with this gentleman that we didn't really find out if people want a town center and businesses and a town green. And a lot of the conversation around the committee was, well, this was picked up from the draft in 94. Well, that's 20 years old now. So I think there are a lot of ways in this day and age with technology to do quick um, surveys that can give you a lot of information uh, online, monkey surveys, so forth. People do it all the time. So I guess I'm reiterating what everyone else has said. I also agree with Mary Townsend that <coughs> The appointments committee is an extremely important committee on the council, and sometimes I think, I know when I was on it, I just waited for people to flow through the door. We interviewed them, we were thrilled they showed up, and we tried to appoint them. Um, but as I think about it now, I think part of the job of the appointments committee is to actually solicit people to come in. You go out and you talk to friends, you maybe try to find people that might be contrarian to the view that you have, to try to get the broadest um, most democratic viewpoint on whatever work you're, you're doing. Um, I know Frank Governelli did that with the Open Space Committee, and I really admired his um, gumption <laughs> to, to, to take that on. And he got a really great committee for it. And my final point is, I think if we're going to call these things citizen committees, they really should be citizen committees. Um, I personally don't think there should be town councilors on it, and I don't think there should be paid staff as um, the head of it or as a liaison, because that puts such a heavy thumb on the scale that I think a lot of times the citizens feel that they're just there filling a seat and that whatever agenda was sort of preconceived comes into the room. So I would suggest that you form citizen committees and you trust these people who are generally intelligent and competent to actually run their committee. They appoint their secretary, they appoint their chair, they appoint a small committee to draft the report, and they're there's no elected official, there's no staff person there. And I think what you might find is some really creative, fresh ideas and something in the end that is more reflective of the citizens, because hopefully they're one and they're talking to people, um, and therefore might be more widely embraced when the final report comes out. Obviously, you guys could tweak it, whatever you want, but it would be a fresh, a truly fresh look at whatever the issue is. I know when I served on the Alternative Energy Committee, which was um, purely citizens, they did such an amazing job. They got an award from Echo Man. They really knocked it out of the park. And I think it was because they were really left alone to, to a large degree, and they were passionate about the topic. So I would just leave you with that to consider that a citizen committee should be a citizen committee. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Public hearing is closed. Item, non, item <coughs> excuse me, number 124, the town center plan. 
draft motion. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby adopts the September 4, 2014 <coughs> draft of the Cape Elizabeth Town Center plan as a planning guide for land use in the town center zone. Is there um, a motion or Councilor Sherman, would you like to address this? No, I was looking at like to make a motion. Wagner to see if he, <laughs> <laughs> both of us were on the committee, if you wanted to make the motion. Or? Sure. Okay. Um, I move that um, Cape Elizabeth Town Council adopt the September 4, 2014 draft of the Cape Elizabeth Town Center Plan as a planning guide for the land use in the Town Center Zone. And I'll second the motion. All right. Discussion. Councilor Jordan? Well, I just have a question. Um, going through it, maybe somebody who was on the committee could recap what the public participation was since that was brought up several times. I know there was a survey and I read through all the responses, but um, maybe we, if there's more, we could elaborate it for the public's interest. Sure, Council Wagner. Well, we can both speak to it, yeah. but um, I, I heard, I think I believe it's Mr. Clark, but um, I, I sat through almost all, I think I'm going to miss one meeting, but um, I think I have a different interpretation of what the, the feedback that we received from the public was. And I certainly didn't receive the feedback that the town as a whole does not want businesses in the town center. Quite to the contrary, I, I, I don't believe that was the input that we received. But we don't need to get into the, the individual points so much. But I think that we had pretty good public input on this. We had a, um, what do we call it, a forum? What well, was about 80 people, I think, came to that. And then we had online surveys that people could log on to the website and uh, their input. We received a tremendous amount of email traffic. A lot of the public showed up, albeit usually the same members of the public showed up at the, the uh, individual meetings and <coughs> all well publicized. What you, what you find is there's often a small amount of the public that's in, interested in giving input <coughs> into uh, what the town's doing. Um, but I think we received reasonable input. I, I happened to be an advocate at the time when we formed the committee that we spend some money on it and that we actually do a statistical survey. I was in the minority on that viewpoint and that, that didn't get, that didn't happen. But I'm satisfied that we received good public input. Uh, I would have liked to add more, but we got what we got and I think that the town center plan is reflective of the sentiments that we received. Uh, I mean, I think Jamie uh, did a good job describing it. At every meeting there was, per our town <coughs> council policy, there was an opportunity at the beginning for people to speak, as well as at the end. Uh, so although there were a number of folks who, who <coughs> did a lot of our meetings, we did hear from a number of citizens at our, our meetings, as well as the public forum. And you did have, including your public forum, you did have, I think, 17 meetings. Oh, you had a, quite a few meetings. <laughs> so there, there were... And that which were all public. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we did also meet separately with the library planning committee too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, yeah, Council Walsh. That original question that was brought up about um, our in the in the document our openness to consider or modify ordinances is that something that we can get a little clarity around whether in fact that is an issue or something that needs to be looked at in terms of the language that's in our recommended mm -hmm. town. Plan? I'm just curious. It was the very first speaker. And I'm sorry, could oh. you repeat that, Council Walsh? The very first speaker brought up the issue or question to town council about the village green issue and some of the language that's contained in this town center plan that we have an openness to modifying ordinances to either assist, help, support, whatever. I'm just wondering if there, somebody could address that. Councilor Sherman? <coughs> if I recall the comment, it, sort of, it was linked to the potential for a town center green by the library. And if, okay, I'm, I'm not remembering the comment. I, I do recall that sentiment being expressed and I, I believe it was the, the town center planning committee's uh, <coughs> goal that a, a town uh, green be placed somewhere along Route 77 as opposed to in front of the library. That green space has been there for decades and not a single planning group, town council, et cetera, ever focused on that as a town green. So with all due respect to the proponents of that, I often view that as a bit of a red herring. Um, I didn't think that that was really what 
people had in mind when they talked about a town green, which was mm -hmm. uh, part and parcel trying to make the town center more attractive to get traffic to slow down as uh, cars travel through the town center on Route 77. So anyway, uh, but I'm not sure what. Yeah, I'm what just curious what, the, yeah. what is. Um, yeah, Councilor, I'm sorry. The Public hearing is closed, yes. Mr. Clark. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Uh, Council Wagner? Well, in the original draft of the town center plan, we had in language right. proposing um, a potential ordinance change right. with regards to the town center green on this side of 77. Right. So, and I know Mr. Seidman had some um, concerns about that, as did other members of the community. And my understanding is that's been removed because it's not necessary. Well, Anyway, it's been removed, and the right. town center plan has been modified so that no, there's no suggestion for ordinance change at this point. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, additionally, um, <clears throat> Caitlin and, uh, and, and Jamie had uh, submitted a report to us a couple of months back, sort of a post-mortem, if you will, on the Conservation Commission's work on um, and um, some, a deep dive about process and potential areas where we could improve process. While Mary Townsend's comments to us today may or may not have related to the subject at hand here, there was a lot of suggestion about process in what was done in the past and what we ought to be doing in the future. And I think if you remember, we decided that we should take your input from that report coupled with what we're learning from other committees that we've charged over the last several months or years and trying to sort of amalgamate that into some changes. So I appreciate the input that's been given here and I just want to make sure that the citizens understand that we're listening and we certainly understand that you know process is an important thing. People need to feel committed, not disenfranchised by the process at any level. So I, I just think it's important that we just kind of log for the record. We're, we're hearing it, and uh, clearly you folks did some great work on the last deep dive that we did. And clearly in this case, <clears throat> we're hearing more information that needs to be included in whatever we design for the future. So again, I appreciate Mary's comments. Thank you. <clears throat> any, any other discussion? Thanks. Good one, Scott. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the town manager? I just wanted to clarify two points. It, it was mentioned 2.7 million cost of sidewalks, and uh, that's actually for both sidewalks and drainage projects. And uh, the cost is really driven by drainage. And you know, unlike the library, which if approved would be spent all at once, this is actually would be spent over any number of years. It's not determined in the plan how many number of years, but certainly not upfront at, at one time. The, ne the next item on the agenda, in fact, is looking at a long-term funding mechanism to help uh, right. partially pay for that. So I just want to, I just want to clarify that the 2.7 million isn't for sidewalks. The, the other, there was a suggestion for more linkages in in the town center, and you know, as you know, as the motion that that uh, Councillor Wagner made, this is a planning guide, and you know, the, the concept is is to have linkages to improve pedestrian improvement. Some of the specifics are going to come on this over time, but it, it was, it's good to have these different suggestions and to have an opportunity to provide clarity as a result of some of the comments. Well, thank you. And I, I think it's also point, important to remind everyone that this is a guide for land use. A guide. <coughs> Anyone else? Well, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Next item is a public hearing on the Town Center Tax Increment Financing District. Um, I would like to open the, the public hearing. Again, there's no overall time limit, but each individual speaker will have three minutes. Is there anyone that would like to speak to the Town Center Tax Increment Financing District proposal? Seeing no one, I'll close that public hearing. Item number 125, the Town Center Tax Increment Financing District application. I'm going to ask just the town manager to, to just briefly mention this. He did give the council a workshop on the item. Yeah, the, the Tax Increment Financing District, uh, first of all, is a certain location. In this case, it's the Town Center Zone, which, which is in pink. And any increase in taxes uh, that happens 
uh, in this area within a certain period of time, if it's in a tax increment finance district, is sheltered from the state tax valuation. As a result of being sheltered from the state tax valuation, uh, the county tax would not inc does not increase as much as it otherwise would, and the school subsidy does not decrease uh, to the extent that it would. So really, it's it's uh, you know a tax increment finance district is looked at as smart tax policy, and the instead of uh, the, the, with the sheltering that occurs is the, the additional revenue that comes from development in this area is set aside specifically for improvements in the area, such as the aforementioned <coughs> sidewalks and drainage improvements. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> is there a motion? to approve the application to the state of, of Maine for a tax increment financing district in the town center zone. We already had it. Nobody talked. Okay. No one talked. Uh, Councilor McCausland? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Walsh, any discussion? Concerns or questions for the town manager? Councilor Sherman. Uh, I, I was negligent in the, the last discussion of our last motion. I didn't have an opportunity to thank the members of the town center plan committee, <coughs> uh, which we, Jay and I, uh, have said many times how hard this committee worked, uh, how much we appreciate the efforts. Uh, I didn't realize it was 17 meetings, uh, but they were not always easy meetings uh, to attend, and this committee really per per persevered. Uh, so I want to thank, uh, we have our chair here, Stephanie Carver. Uh, Peter Curry is also here in the audience tonight. So thank you both and also the rest of the Town Center Planning Committee, as well as uh, our staff person who, in my opinion, did make the process a much better, more effective one, notwithstanding some of the comments earlier tonight. Thank you. I agree with Councilor Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? <clears throat> All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 126, report from the Ordinance Committee regarding roosters. I would like to ask the Ordinance Chairwoman, Kathy Ray, to give us a little update on that. Thank you. Um, the Ordinance Committee met on September 19th to discuss um, the issue of roosters as it was brought up to us from some citizens. And um, I'll try to be brief, but I will also mention that um, the um, town planner and police chief are here for any questions that you might call on. Um, they were both very helpful, um, specifically to um, being able to talk with the police chief about enforcement. Because enforcement became a big issue um, in terms of how do we enforce an ordinance. And as the ordinance committee, I think we wrestled with a lot of different pieces of this. Um, and I say that because I think we, we went sort of all over the place and sort of came back to um, the proposal, which is to um, restrict roosters on lot sizes of 40, under 40,000 feet, square feet. And I can't, is, is Maureen? I can't see if she's over there. Yes. She's the, oh, sorry. I, I was looking here. Maureen's here if you wish to see the map, and she can put it on the back wall. But um, what I will say is that we first uh, went over the summary of the process that we went through in 2011, and that process um, had a proposed ordinance, which included a lot of different animals. Um, at the time, it was done to, to deal with a rooster issue, and I guess the rooster went away, and so we dropped the ordinance process. Um, we also, I'm just looking over my notes, um, we also looked at, uh, we talked with the police chief and uh, Ms. O'Meara about how we could put something together that was enforceable <coughs> again. Um, we talked about decibels, we talked about setbacks from property lines, we talked about um, special callers. Um, when we talked about distance of the coop from the property line, we got into issues that would end up going to the planning board um, in terms of fencing, types of fencing, and so forth. Um, when we talked about noise, because we've been approached by about the noise piece several times, in order to regulate noise, um, it's a much more complex item than you might think. Um, 
and I think that's where um, the police chief was helpful in saying, well, how do we enforce this? Um, somebody complains about noise, I sent my officers there, do they stay there, they wait till the noise happens, do they try to measure the amount of noise? Um, we talked about age of roosters. When did they start crowing? We had a resident expert that knew a little <laughs> bit about roosters, and he gave us some uh, feedback on that. Um, because I had gone down the path of saying, well, um, what about roosters? How old are they going to be? When did they start to crow? Well, they apparently can do that at different points in their life. How do we tell the difference when we talk about chicks and how sometimes it can be hard to decide what sex the chicks are? So I just, I tell you all this because I think it's important that you know that we really had a fairly lengthy conversation. Um, um, in fact, um, Councillor Wagner had done some research on his computer. I don't remember the name of the, the oh, mypetchicken.com, I think it was. So. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so we ended up that um, Councillor Walsh made a motion to recommend to change the Chapter 12 miscellaneous ordinances to ban roosters on lots of less than 40,000 square feet. Um, Councillor Wagner seconded the motion. Um, we thanked a bunch of people for their input because we did have uh, people from the uh, public that came and spoke. Um, we also um, had um, Victoria Valent there who had um, had it before, in, back in 2011 when it was at the planning board piece and had to come to the town council. So she had filled us in on some of the, the prior work as well as um, uh, Maureen. So um, I will say that the map, um, if you'd like to see it, does include a number of lots. But what's important to also rem remember is that this only covers 11% of the actual land in Cape Elizabeth. So although it, it, it covers a lot, number of lots, it would affect a number of lots. It only affects 11% of the, the actual land in the town. Um, so I'm not sure if I've given you everything that you wanted, but um, as I said, the police chief and the town planner are here and can, are, are here specifically to, to help us with this issue should there be any more you know, questions that come up. Okay. I mean, what, we're, what the uh, motion is is to set a public hearing for next month. Would any councils like to see the map of the lots that the number shows the number of lots and the location of lots that are under 40,000 square feet? Does anyone like to see it? Or are you comfortable with that knowledge already? No? Okay. Any, uh, is, is there a motion then to set a public hearing for Thursday, November 6, 2014? After you make the motion. Council Ray. So moved. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Council Walsh. Any further discussion? Council Wagner. Uh, I just, you know, I, I um, haven't heard a tremendous amount of public uh, response to this, uh, opposing this concept. I've heard a little. Um, but I would encourage anybody that wants to continue to keep roosters or ever have roosters, if there is anything that you want to present to the council, Prior to the public hearing, I would encourage the, those citizens to do so. For example, the concept of rooster collars. If there was some submission of <coughs> proof or evidence that these things are effective, let us hear about it before the public hearing, or certainly at the public hearing. But I would encourage people to submit that before the public hearing so we have a chance to consider it. Anyone else? Council Walsh? I, I just, um, this is really for Kathy and for Jamie, because we discussed the uh, public. Um, notification, if you will, about this hearing. Um, we obviously, when we had the astrological high tide plus three, we expanded the communication for that. Uh, we have a little bit of feedback from some people saying it was a little bit too late, if you will, in the process. So I don't know whether we need to amend this to include expanding, because every, well, how many lots? We're talking 2,300, is that correct? I think it was 2,800 lots. 2,800 lots. So, you know, I think we've got we've to be more robust about communicating to those folks who are going to have a change in the use of their 40,000 square foot lot. 
Um, I, I just want to make sure that that's covered and that we don't just assume it's happening because when we get here a month from now, I want to make sure people have heard about this, not just from the news media, but also something from us. So. Councilor Ray. Um, we did talk about that. I'm glad you brought that up. We did talk about that <coughs> at the Ordinance Committee meeting um, because as um, Council Walsh said, you know, we try to make sure that people who are affected are being notified. But we talked about the number of individuals, uh, number of lot owners that would be, need to be notified. We came up with a fairly large number to mail them a notification. And I <coughs> looked at Maureen because I don't remember ballpark what that number was, but. It was well over $1,000, I recall, oh, yes. in the minutes. Well, we So I just Tell, wanted to bring that up get a group uh, okay. because initially we said, no, let's do that. We did that with the high watermark, but then we started looking at the numbers right. and said maybe that's not the most effective way to, to potentially communicate with lot owners. So I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sharon. I mean, it would seem to me if the proposed ordinance change goes to the heart of somebody's ability to enjoy his or her property, like changing the high water mark definition, suddenly the lot's no longer buildable <coughs> or potentially. Uh, that's one thing, but in the last five to ten years, uh, we've had, I guess, two cases of a rooster in a densely a dense neighborhood, and so I, I just don't view this as an issue that rises to the level where we need to send notification to every single lot affected. It's been publicized in the Cape Courier and the newspapers. I mean, it, it's easy to make fun of it, roosters, ha ha, and I'm not unsympathetic to the Kennedys. I'm not unsympathetic to the neighbors, but I, I don't think we need to spend that kind of money on a notification, because then it seems to me any ordinance change would require that, and I don't think that's a precedent that we'd want to set. Thank you. Any other discussion? Councilor Jordan? I just had a question about how it works with grandfathering of ordinances. We put a lot of ordinances into effect, and people are grandfathered because they had a pre-existing thing, and then we've gone ahead and changed it. So. What is the legal concept behind that? And is there any way it could be argued and applied here where you purchased something, did something with your property, and now we're changing it and basically making you change something that you've already been doing on your lot? My other question was um, the noise versus rooster. To me, this is a noise issue. Um, Jamie was saying that you know he's heard a few people comment about their dislike of this ordinance. I've heard a, a lot from several people, and I've encouraged them, and I encourage everybody to continue to give as much feedback to the council, because as we heard earlier, public input, we can't do anything without it. I mean, it's just our best guess up here if we don't hear from the public. But I'd like to hear from Chief Williams as to how this and a barking dog ordinance relates, because we have a barking dog ordinance, and basically is that meaningless, or should we next be looking at banning dogs in the town of Cape Elizabeth, because it's unenforceable? Thank you. Thank you. I didn't want you to come for nothing. No, no, I, I, and I appreciate that, too. I appreciate that. No, uh, uh, quite frankly, dogs and roosters are two separate items. Uh, when we talk about dogs, dogs don't bark all the time. Not all dogs bark. My understanding is roosters make the cock a doodle do in the morning, and uh, from what I've read, could be through the day several times. And there is nothing to really to stop them that I'm aware of. Um, whereas dogs, when you go down and speak to the owner, could you take them inside? For example. I'll use myself. I have two small dogs. If there's another dog that's walking in the area, they'll bark, but I'll go get them and I'll take them in. So they don't habitually bark for a long period of time. If there's no dogs out there, my dogs won't bark. My understanding with a rooster is it doesn't matter if there's anything outside, it's going to cock a doodle doo. Therefore, it's much cleaner for us that are going to enforce it, to make it, you can't have any roosters on a piece of property under 40,000 square feet. So 
My question is, right now we have a barking dog ordinance. So if you get called because there's a dog barking, you go to the residence and the people are given an opportunity to make their dog stop. If they can't make their dog stop barking, what happens? What we would do is we'd first of all go to the complaint and or go down into the area to see if we hear the dog barking. Then we go to the complaint and say, what's the story? They, they would either point the house out where the noise was coming from, and we would have them uh, sign a statement, write out a statement as to what happened. Then we'd go to the um, uh, dog owner's residence and ask them, what's the story with the dog? Yeah, either no, my, it wasn't my dog barking, well, we have a complaint that it was your dog, and try to mediate the situation. And quite frankly, we do the same thing in the rooster. We, we try to mediate the situation. That's why it's taken so long. I mean, I've been here 35 years, and this is probably the second rooster or third rooster that I've had to handle or been, you know, um, associated with. And so it's, it's really not that big of a deal because in the past two incidences, we've mediated the situation and it's gone away. So I guess that's my point, is right now we're saying you've had two instances in the past how many years, and we're going to take steps that make it so that who knows how many roosters are in this town, but we're effectively saying you can't have roosters anymore even though you've had it for years, your neighbors aren't complaining, everybody's fine, but if you keep that rooster you're going to be breaking the laws of Cape Elizabeth. My thought was if you make it a crowing rooster like a barking dog, then the, the Kennedy's neighbor, sorry I can't pronounce your name, um, would have an avenue to call you and then if the rooster won't stop and it becomes an issue, he has a mechanism to make the rooster go away. But all the other households in, in the, the town would be able to keep their rooster. First of all, if I understood no, no, you... I, I don't think she asked the question. I think she made a statement. So. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Could I respond to it? <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you, Chief Williams. I'll send it. Okay. Councilman McCausland. So I have a question. Did the Ordinance Committee talk about the effect of rooster noise on other lots that are larger than 40,000 square feet? So if someone has a lot that's 80,000 square feet and they have a rooster and their rooster causes problems for the people next door. Are we planning to come back and revisit the issue as a noise issue at that point? And I, I think that's what Caitlin is getting at, that we have still the potential for the same kind of problem that we have with barking dogs, just on a bigger lot size. And I'd love to hear a response yeah. from Councilor Wagner. Yeah, we, we did discuss bigger lot sizes, and we thought that that wasn't really the issue in front of the Ordinance Committee. It was talking about small lot sizes. That's where the problems cropped up. And bigger lot sizes, we haven't heard complaints about. But I, I, I remember raising it, saying, like, well, what about a, a rooster right next to the property line on an 80,000 foot lot? It could be close to the next person's house. So, yeah, it's feasible. But that's not what we're hearing as the, the source of the complaint. And it, it, Councilor Ray? And it also doesn't stop us from revisiting it should that become an issue. Because um, we did talk about it, but decided that, as Jamie said, it wasn't what, it wasn't what was brought to us for the, the issue. And um, just, like with any, just like with any of the ordinances, should we find that it's not working or it's created a new issue or whatever, then we can come back and revisit it and say, Okay, we need to expand or contract or change or whatever. I, I, I guess mm -hmm. uh, to, to your point earlier in, the, in our session, not today, but past, mm -hmm. we try to legislate as little as possible at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? All those in favor of setting a public hearing for Thursday, November 6, 2014 at 7 p.m.? It's unanimous. <clears throat> Item number 127, Fort Williams Park Use Request. Again, I'd like to ask the town manager to introduce this item, since he's the, the staff 
uh, liaison on the 250th anniversary committee. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering where you were going to go with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, Barbara Powell was uh, speaking at, I think, historic preservation this evening uh, and was hoping that we wouldn't get to this until she got here, but we're at it. So, anyway, Bob Ayotte is here, who's the chairman of the uh, chairman or president? What are you? President of the, the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. This would be a joint activity of both the, the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation, it, that's a misnomer and that I wrote in the agenda, not the Cape Elizabeth Charitable Foundation, uh, and, and the anniversary committee. And what they're looking at is a Portland Symphony Orchestra concert on July 25th, 2015, uh, to commemorate the 250th anniversary of Cape Elizabeth's incorporation. This is uh, one week before the Beach to Beacon road race. Uh, and they would have sponsorships that would pay for much of the cost of the symphony uh, and they'd like to get started with planning for this. It's been reviewed by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, I believe had unanimous support and because this is a municipal activity we would not be charging fees under this proposal uh, for the use of the park. But the 250th anniversary committee is excited about it and, I think, and the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation has also had quite a bit of citizen involvement and in helping to plan it, not just members of their board, but other citizens as well who, who were excited about the prospect of bringing the symphony uh, back to Fort Williams. The, the particular area where the concert will be uh, this time, the proposal is on the, the field right next to Portland Headlight, which is different from anyone who remembers the old days when yeah. they were uh, up by the parade ground. So it uh, could be an exciting event and there's, there's a proposed rain date uh, in case it's a little too exciting on July 25th. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there a motion to uh, approve the request um, to utilize Fort Williams Park for a concert by the Portland Symphony Orchestra on July 25, 2015, with a rain date of July 26, 2015? Council Walsh. I'm happy to move item 127 as written. And is there a second? Council McCausland. Any further discussion or questions for the manager, Councilor Jordan? I'm just happy there's a rain date set. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Councilor Ray. Does the um, week before the Beach to Beacon give the town sufficient time to deal with this and the Beach to Beacon? Yeah, it, that was reviewed uh, a couple of weeks ago. They had a conference call with the town staff, with representatives of the Charitable Foundation, with, and with representatives of the Anniversary Committee. and. It, it, there was there had been talk about having it that the night at the beach to beacon and quite frankly staff was not enamored of that idea uh but uh it's believed by having it a week before it sort of kicks off you know you know this is beach to beacon week coming up but but it also keeps and maintains the focus that that it's really about the 250th anniversary thank you any other comments questions all those in favor it's unanimous. Item number 128, the Cottage Brook subdivision acceptance of open space, conservation easement, and public roads. I will again ask the town manager to give us a brief uh, description of, of, of this item. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Solomon. When the town council, uh, actually when the planning board reviews uh, proposed subdivisions, uh, during the time of, of the subdivision review, it comes to the town council for conditional approval. And what the, the town council does uh, when it does conditional approval is they look at the open space that's proposed to off, be offered and say, yes, we, we'll accept that when it's offered. They also look at the proposed public roads and other public improvements and they say, yes, we'll accept it once it's built. Uh, so that was in 2006. It shows how long some of these things take. At that point, I think it might have still been called the Spurwink Woods subdivision. Uh, now it's the Cottage Brook subdivision. Uh, this is off Spurwink Avenue, right near the South Portland line. I think David, uh, if you, I, I actually put in your packet copies of minutes that might, might have brought back some painful memories. Uh, <laughs> but regardless, uh, the subdivision eventually got approved. The council agreed to accept uh, these things as it moved along. And, here we are, all these eight years later, uh, with uh, a lot of trees gone and with a recession uh, passing by and uh, with people already living in some nice homes uh, in this subdivision. And it, the roads have been accepted, they've been inspected by the town engineer, 
uh, is the, the phases that are indicated here. Uh, all of the deeds and all the materials have been reviewed by the town engineer, and uh, the the uh, developers' representatives have actually signed all the necessary paperwork. And the only thing that's left for us to uh, possibly go out and plow these roads this winter is for the town council to take action this evening. Uh, accepting as proposed item number 128 and uh, I'd suggest that you not read its entirety. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, uh, allowed, I mean, you can read it but not allowed. Yeah. Any discussion or questions, Councilor Wall? No, no. Do you need a motion? Did, did we have a motion? No, we had a motion. Oh, I apologize. Is there a motion? to approve the Cottage Brook subdivision acceptance of open space, conservation, easement, and public roads. Oh, we, our, our departing <laughs> councilor next meeting wants to make that motion. Well, just given my <laughs> long history with this project, I actually bumped into the developer's attorney the other day, and uh, we took a little trip down memory lane, uh, Sperling Woods, now known as Cottage Brook. Cottage Brook. Yeah, anyway, I, so I uh, moved that we uh, Oh God, I gotta find the emotion, excuse me. Uh, that we accept from Spurring Woods LLC a certain tractor parcel of land situated in the town of Cape Elizabeth, as well as the roads outlined in our materials. Thank you, is there a second? Council Walsh. Any uh, further discussion or questions? Council Wagner. Maybe if Michael could just sum it up in a couple of sentences as to what the kind of public benefit of this conservation e easement will be. You know, it, it will be like many of our other easements. There'll be trails uh, along there for the public to enjoy. It will connect into other trails. Uh, but you know, in, you know, the major piece is I forget the exact what nine something acres of land that will never be developed that will be available uh, not only for quiet enjoyment but also to look at as well. So uh, it's uh, you know good open space preservation in that. Uh, neighborhood of the community and I think particularly when people see all the trees that came out when the neighborhood was developed they're even more appreciative that at least there'll be nine acres that uh, they won't see that happen again. Anyone else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, let's move on to item, <coughs> item number 129, signs on traffic islands. It's proposed to refer to the Ordinance Committee of re a review of policies regarding signs on traffic islands. Um, we all had the opinion from the town attorney in our packet. I don't know if the town manager would like to say a few words about this. Only as if well. you'd like me to. I think it was pretty straightforward, personally. Is there a motion to refer to the Ordinance Committee this review of policies regarding signs on traffic islands? Council Wagner? So moved. Is there a second? Council Sherman. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. And item number 130, Code of Ethics. It's proposed to adopt a proposed Code of Ethics for members of the Town Council. I'd like to ask Councilor Sherman to just give a little brief presentation of this, since he's worked very hard on it. Uh, sure. Uh, it was a few months ago where the Council had as a workshop agenda item uh, the idea that perhaps we should adopt a code of ethics for the town council. Uh, there were follow-up workshops where we reviewed drafts. Uh, I, as uh, a member of the council, took a laboring oar in drafting a, propose, a proposal for the council to consider and adopt. Uh, that uh, version went through a, a couple of iterations. Uh, we borrowed, I will confess, uh, provisions that were from other towns that we thought were quite good. Uh, we also made changes to those and added our own original sections. Uh, and I believe over the span of two council workshops, I received feedback from the rest of the council, uh, which brings us to tonight, which is, I hope, the final version of the Code of Ethics for the Council to consider. One thing that I did want to make clear is that the Code uh, is intended to apply to members of the council. We had discussions about whether it should apply to members of other boards and commissions, and we felt like we ought to just start uh, with the council itself and adopt a code for us. And then if we felt that it was appropriate, we might <coughs> ask other boards or commissions uh, to take a look and see whether they ought to do something similar. So this is really, this is intended and provides that it applies to the council only. Thank you, Councilor Sherman. Is there a motion to, to approve 
the, I'm sorry, to adopt the proposed code of ethics for members of the town council. Yes, so moved. Uh, Councilor Sherman, is there a second? second. Council Walsh, any further discussion? Councilor Wagner? Just wanted to thank David for, for doing the work that he did, did on this. And I actually did review the clean draft and I have no further comments. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor McCoslin? Yes, I wanted to say the same. I think we call this your swan song. Nicely done. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Councilor Walsh? Compliments as well, but I also want to compliment my colleagues because I think this is a, a major step and one that I'm very pleased to be part of in terms of setting the ethical bar for our committee, for the town to all understand exactly what, to, what the standards are we're following and doing our business by. So again, I thank each and every one of you for your input. Great, I, Councilor Ray. Just wanted to thank uh, Councilor Sher Sherman for, for all his work because it looked like it was a lot of work. And then when we got together, we we're all sort of throwing out, "Well, how about oh, what about this sentence and changing that?" And he's rapidly taking notes. And I don't think he's always ever going to incorporate all of that, but he did, and he did a wonderful job. So thank you. Well, thank you. Anyone else? I, I'd like to echo all the sentiments. I. I, I think that this is something that we all can be extremely proud of. It does uh, raise the bar for our ethical conduct here in Cape Elizabeth, and I think it's an outstanding document. So, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Now we have a, uh, an opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone wishing to do so? Seeing no one, that opportunity is closed. At this point, uh, we have item number 131, an executive session request um, <clears throat> to enter, I'm sorry, it is requested to enter into executive session to discuss the status of collective bargaining with local 340 of the Teamsters representing Public Works employees. Is there a motion to enter into executive session? David Councilor McCausland. <laughs> David really wants to do this. He's no, okay. I made enough motions. <laughs> so Councilor McCausland. So moved. Moved. Is there a second? Council Walsh. All right. Any discussion? Uh, it, it, just the motion would reflect the statutory sections. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you, would you read that in its entirety, please? Uh, yes, it is. Thanks. Do I have to read? It is requested to enter into, or I request that we enter into executive session to discuss the status of collective bargaining with Local 340 of the Teamsters, representing Public Works employees, according to number one. You'll have to remind me what MRSA stands for. Just, Just say MRSA. MRSA. Statutes. Annotated. 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 Thank you. Uh, subsection 40568. Just seconded. <laughs> okay. <you>. Any discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor? It's unanimous. And what time is it? It is 8 Okay. And we may be coming back into public session, but not on television. Okay. 